Hey, what is up guys, Murgerman4 here, and today I'm going to be talking about Ascension of the Cybermen and the Timeless Children, the long-awaited finale of Doctor Who Series 12 uh, that was really quite explosive. Um, so, yeah, why don't we get right into it. So, uh, right off the bat, let me just say, Chris Chibnall, what a bad lad. Like, he just, he, he, he went from having next to no continuity in the last season to having, like, all the continuity in this season. The Timeless Children is one of the most continuity-heavy episodes probably in the show's history, and... <laughs> It delves so much into the show's lore, and um, to be honest, I while I was watching it, I, I felt like it honestly could have been a, a fitting 60th anniversary special, even. Like, that's how much it goes into this stuff. Now, here's the thing. It was bound to be divisive, and it very much has been. I don't think we've had this divisive of an episode, at least, you know, in terms of actual, like, continuity-wise and stuff, since Hellbent, which, ironically, um, I've discovered that how most people feel about Hellbent is how I feel about the Timeless Children, and <laughs> vice versa, how uh, I feel about Hellbent is how most other people feel about the Timeless Children. Which, if you didn't know, I despise Tell Ben. And, um, I'll just say it right off the bat here. I honestly love the Timeless Children. Of course, uh, let's not forget, there is also a first part to this, Ascension of the Cybermen. I'll talk about that first. Um, it is very much one story, but they're two very different episodes. Um, Ascension of the Cybermen, I have to admit, was a little underwhelming. It continues off of the haunting of Villa Diodati uh, with the lone Cyberman, Ashad, and he's got the Siberium now, and he's trying to basically bring the cyber race to whole new glories after they were almost wiped to extinction. So now we're at the end of the Cyber Wars. There's only a few stragglers of both humanity and the Cybermen left in at least the majority of the universe pretty much, and it's basically a story all about survival, and while I wouldn't go so far as to say it's the best Cybermen portrayal in the new series, uh, that still goes to world enough in time, it is definitely up there. Uh, a, a shot has just brought a whole new level of depth to the Cybermen, and it, it was really neat to continue to explore his motivations, because he, he, as I mentioned in the last review, he has chosen to become a Cyberman. He wasn't forced into this. He genuinely believes that this is the right thing. Oh, I also want to mention the pre-title sequence for Ascension of the Cybermen was great. How we have like just the cyber pieces floating through space with a shot giving his little narration. And then as the camera goes into the cyber eye, then that's when the title sequence comes up. I loved that. That's, um... Probably the only pre-title sequence from this season that I actually liked. And the, Chris Trimmel, before we saw the Cybermen um, months ago, he mentioned that the Cybermen uh, in this season were going to be relentless. And that very much plays out as true here. They feel really like a force to be reckoned with. And, I mean, by the end of the episode, we've got a gigantic army of them. But for the majority of it, you've only got three Cybermen, really. You've got Ashad, and then his two other Cybermen that have been following him around. And uh, I, I thought it was curious that they used the Cybus Cybermen design from 2006 uh, instead of the more recent Nightmare and Silver designs. Uh, there are elements of that included in Ashad, and also uh, there is a brand new design of Cybermen here that uses elements from Nightmare and Silver. But... Um, 
yeah, it was interesting to see the Cybus Cybermen again, and they're back to saying like delete and stuff, which I don't think we've even heard a Cyberman say that since before the Moffat era, uh, maybe in his early years. So that was kind of a bit nostalgic. Uh, we also got these cyber drones, which are basically just flying cyber heads, which <laughs> were pretty dumb, but they were also fun. So I don't really mind them too much. It was interesting to see these Cybermen just clinging on, because both them and the humans are pretty much on the edge of extinction here. And uh, it's basically just a race against time. Like, can the humans run fast enough and long enough to escape from the Cybermen and yeah I thought I thought they were portrayed really well it was also nice as well to have our main group uh, split up for most of the episode it did help to raise the stakes quite a bit you have Graham and Yaz who are with most of the humans as they're um, trying to run away and then the doctor and Ryan are uh, on a mission to obviously stop the the Cybermen and they all end up trying to go to this place called Kosharmus, which they actually find out is actually a person um, who is guarding this barrier that basically links up to random parts of the universe so that the humans can go through and escape from the Cybermen, and then the Cybermen can't follow because when they go through, it'll lead to somewhere else. So that's their main goal, trying to get there, which we don't reach until the end of the episode. Uh, yeah, and we're introduced to a new design of Cybermen, the Warrior class. Cybermen here, and I'm not a huge fan of the bodies, to be honest, but the head design is definitely my favorite of New Who. They, they feel very much like the invasion style Cyberman heads, and yeah, I just, I think it's a, a great helmet design. Really properly chilling. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is about it. It just, it really clicks with me. The final piece of Ascension of the Cybermen, really, is throughout the episode we get these scattered clips of this boy's entire life from baby to older man, uh, Brendan. He's basically found abandoned as a child, um, so he gets adopted, he goes into the, um, I guess, the, the guards, uh, they're in Ireland. Uh, he ends up falling off a cliff at one point, but ends up surviving it mysteriously. Uh, he becomes an old man, retires, but then his dad and the police officer, or the, the guard who hired him, they're like the same age as they were before, and they bring him and they put this device on his head that uh, is going to wipe his memories. That's all we get from Ascension of the Cybermen from that part of the story, and I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but um, I do want to say it just, this didn't work with me at all. Uh, especially not with what we learn about it in The Timeless Children. It just feels so out of place. It doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of the episode, which it kind of sucks. And that leads me to my biggest issue with Ascension of the Cybermen, is I really like the the tone of it, the feel of it. That's, that's great. And the, the basic plot of it is really good as well. But we never get any sort of resolutions in this episode. All it does is add on more questions, which, sure, it's the first part, but we should still be getting some reward from this episode. And I didn't feel that at all. It just felt like 100% set up and no resolution, which there should have been at least something. I don't know necessarily what that would have been, but there should at least be some mini-arc in that episode that gets resolved somehow. But yeah, nothing does, so it ends up being a bit more, feeling a bit more hollow than it should. Because it doesn't wrap anything up. It leaves all of that to the Timeless Children. And not all of it is answered in the Timeless Children, which is fine because I'm sure some of it is going to be held over to Series 13. In fact, I'm pretty sure Chris Chibnall said as much, but um, yeah, it just... That didn't sit well with me. As well, the other thing too, which doesn't ultimately affect the episode as a whole, but I just found the cliffhanger to be really sloppy. Like, basically, the, the rift opens and it leads to Gallifrey. And that's, that's great. But then the master jumps through, 
says some silly line and then immediately switches to saying a much more serious line and then then it's over it's like I don't know it just the, the cliffhanger there wasn't a slow enough build up to it I guess it just kind of felt like it just kind of popped up so it just left me feeling really underwhelmed but it was great to have the master back which I was sure was gonna happen I wasn't surprised at all like, he, he had unfinished business, as did Gallifrey, so I wasn't surprised that either of those were coming back. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much Ascension of the Cybermen. And then we move on to the Timeless Children, which primarily deals with Gallifrey and the Master and the Timeless Child, of course. The Cybermen do still play a role in this. It's not as big, but I still like their role in this. I don't think that they were done a disservice. And... The Master is so good in this episode. I loved Sasha Dewan's take on the character in Spyfall, but I don't care what anyone says. He's my favorite Master. This, this episode convinced me of it. Sasha Dewan is just... He's so perfect in the role. And he's just so menacing. And, it, well, it's, it's crazy because you look at the behind the scenes stuff and interviews with Sasha Dewan, he is completely different. Like, he doesn't even talk the same when he's the Masters, when he's, you know, just himself. Sasha Dewan, he just completely disappears. And it's incredible. His, his performance is just... It's just amazing. And I just keep finding myself re-watching all of his parts of the episode, because those were by far my favorite stuff of the episode, possibly of the entire season. And it's really great too to have an episode finally properly set primarily on Gallifrey, because the previous two ones that were sort of set on Gallifrey, you've got Day of the Doctor, which was actually about Gallifrey, but you're only really on it for a short amount of time, and then Hellbent was just using Gallifrey as a springboard to bring Clara back. The actual Gallifrey stuff didn't really matter in that episode. So this is our first proper new series episode that is primarily set on Gallifrey and is actually about Gallifrey. And I love what Chris Chibnall has done with it and where he's taken this, this story with the Master destroying Gallifrey and he brings the Cybermen through because he decides he wants to work with them, because of course, he's, he's the master, he's got to work with other, you know, villains. And he gets Ashad to reveal, you know, his ultimate plan, because of course he wants to ascend the Cybermen. Which he reveals is he's, he wants to remove all organic components using this thing called the Death Particle, which destroys everything organic, and ascend to full automation, full machinery. Which, of course, the Master says is stupid, he mocks him, he's just like, oh, you just want to be robots, that's, any idiot can be a robot. So, the Master starts to kind of, like, form a fake alliance with Ashad, ends up killing him, taking the Siberium, and he kept the bodies in the Time Lords that he killed, and decides to create a new hybrid race of cyber time lords basically cybermen who can regenerate and that's a really interesting concept that the show has never explored before so it, it's it's just such a mad plan and it feels like this is probably the closest that the master has ever come to victory on tv because he's got the doctor trapped he's made this big revelation to her um, that has, you know, just completely stunned her and she doesn't know how to take it. He's destroyed Gallifrey. He's got this basically in invincible army. For all intents and purposes, he is on top of the world, you know? Uh, the only other instance I can think of where he's come this close to victory is in the Series 3 finale, because of course he takes over the Earth for an entire year, and that was obviously a huge victory as well. But this one is even more personal because of course it is about the Doctor's home planet and their own people and herself. So it's a much more personal victory, as much as the Doctor cares for Earth. 
And just the, the bit where the master kind of like realizes this. I don't even know how to describe it. It's just the, the way that it's played. He's almost in tears of a, you know, with his joy at his, you know, successes. And it's such a chilling moment. I also want to mention that when he reveals these Cyber Time Lords, the, the track for it that kind of mixes this new Gallifrey or Time Lord theme with the Cybermen theme, and then you also have the Masters theme in there as well. One of my favorite tracks by Sega Nakanola, and possibly one of my favorite tracks in the show, Full Stop. It is awesome. The, the score throughout the whole episode is awesome too, but um, it just feels like the Master has never been higher before. And that is a really, it's just such an intimidating threat. But, of course, this finale was said to uh, change everything. So we have the Timeless Child reveal, and a lot of people are real pissed off about it. People are saying that it completely destroys Doctor Who's lore and history, which I don't get in the slightest. Honestly, uh, on paper, I'm not the biggest fan of the idea. I was fine with the execution, but if I have any complaints about it, it's that it's ultimately pointless because it doesn't really effectively change anything. So I kind of feel the opposite of most people. Most people are upset that it changes too much. I don't think it changed enough to justify its existence, to be honest. And so, of course, uh, the Master brings the Doctor into the Matrix and reveals what he's discovered, that... Time Lord Regeneration was actually discovered by uh, this Time Lord, uh, well, not Time Lord, Gallifrey and Shabagin, they call them, which I thought was a great reference. Anyway, this this native to Gallifrey, Tectaean, discovered this child that had come through this mysterious rift and kind of adopted her as her own daughter and accidentally found out that she could regenerate change her body, heal herself if she died. And so she started experimenting and trying to take the regeneration gene and basically it's just the basic, it's, it's basically the origin of how the Time Lords got regeneration. And it's told, in, it, it's a lot of exposition, but it's told in a really entertaining way I found with obviously the master narrating. Uh, there's this great sequence where we see the Gallifreyan Citadel being built up and it was just such a gorgeous shot. I thought it was really interesting delving into the history of the Time Lords and basically, yeah, they, they just experimented on this timeless child to get the power of regeneration and build Time Lord society. And then it's revealed that the timeless child is the Doctor and that's the big thing that the Doctor had a bunch of incarnations prior to William Hartnell, the first Doctor. And to be honest, I don't have any problem with this, assuming none of them actually were like the character that we know and love as the Doctor. So the only real issue I have with this would be Ruth, because she's implied to be as part of this, but we're not explicitly told so she could still fit in somewhere else. And if she does, then I honestly don't really have any issues with the, the Timeless Child, other than, like I said, the fact that it doesn't ultimately change anything. Because kind of the, the whole message the episode sends is it doesn't matter what the Doctor was before, it matters who she is now and who she's always, you know, believed herself to be. It doesn't matter what her past was. So it's kind of just there to be like, there's a whole bunch of stuff you didn't know, but it doesn't matter that you didn't know it. You're still who you are. So again, like like I said, it just it doesn't really change anything, which is a bit of a shame, to to a degree. But of course, in this reveal, if you're gonna reveal pre-hardened incarnations, 
you've got to legitimize the Morbius Doctors, which obviously that's been a thing for over 40 years, and the Madland Christian will finally did it. He made the Morbius Doctors actually legitimate. Which, this is the other thing I don't get about people's complaints. They're all like, how dare Chris Chibnall do this? But, he's just building off of what other people already set up. Philip Hinchcliffe and Robert Holmes with the Brain of Morbius, Andrew Cartmell during the Seventh Doctor's era. This isn't a new concept. And yeah, the other stuff was obviously not as definitive. It was easier to ignore. But this isn't just Chris Trimble here you should be mad at if you're mad at this. He's just building off what other creators did first. And how it played out, I really don't mind. However, um, another issue I have, I said I would come back to Brendan. What was the point of all it? Like, you could just remove every single reference to Brendan, all those clips, it changes nothing. It doesn't add to your understanding of the story, because the whole thing is he's not even his own incarnation of the Doctor slash Timeless Child. He's just a perception filter or whatever to disguise the original history of the Timeless Child. And here's the thing, it's mentioned in the episode that the Master was beaming those images into the Doctor's head, but in Ascension of the Cybermen, we never get that impression. They're seen as more distinct elements. They're not seen as the Doctor imagining them, which would have made it more effective and actually made it, you know, tie into it more. But as it stands, just remove all that stuff, it makes no difference. It doesn't even help set it up, because it's setting up something it's not giving us any additional information. Everything we see with the Brendan stuff, we see again in the Timeless ch uh, Children. So it's it's useless. Just get rid of it. So that's kind of, that's pretty dumb, to be honest. That, that's probably the thing that annoys me the most about the episode. We also get a return from the Ruth Doctor very briefly. Um, it's kind of left ambiguous if she was actually the Ruth Doctor or an image of the Matrix, but I'm pretty sure it was an image of the Matrix. I think it would be pretty dumb if it was actually the Ruth Doctor. But uh, we don't get a definitive answer about her. Which is somewhat disappointing, but at the same time, given her importance in Fugitive of the Jadoon, and given how we don't get all the answers in The Timeless Children, I have a feeling she is going to be coming back in Series 13 somehow. I don't think we're done with her. I'll be really disappointed if we are, if this is like it. But until, you know, we find that out for sure, I'm alright with what's been done. There's just, there's some more stuff that needs to be clarified. Because I don't think that should be left unsaid. Or unspoken. I, there's got to be more to this. Which would make sense, because like I said, I think, I'm pretty sure Chris Chibnall has said the whole story isn't going to be told in this season. We'll get some answers, but we won't get all of them. It was pretty cool, though, when the Doctor was escaping from the Matrix. She basically just forces it to do a marathon of all the show and all the ex everything in the Doctor's lives. And while it, it's doing that, you actually have the Doctor Who theme playing, which is incredibly cheesy, but I can't help but love it. This is the first time that the theme itself, like the main part of the theme, has actually been used in the show. Like you've had, how do I describe it? Like it's been in the show before stylized, like as part of the score, but this is legitimately like the, the opening theme. Not, not at all stylized to fit in as incidental music. And it's just awesome to have that in, as all those images of the Doctor's adventures and different faces and stuff are going through the Matrix. That was, that was pretty awesome. Ultimately, uh, the Master and his Cyber Masters, as he calls them, are defeated because the Doctor is going to activate the Death Particle, but she can't do it. Um, which, I, I think, there's actually a great conflict between the Doctor and the Master throughout. One of my favorite things about this incarnation of the Master 
is he's got this insanity to him, like the past couple incarnations before him. But here it feels like he's got an actual drive for it. The other ones just felt like they were insane for insanity's sake. This master, he's just got all this underlying rage. He's definitely the angriest master. And that's what drives all of his actions. And one of my favorite moments in the episode is when he's gloating about killing Gallifrey and, you know, destroying the, the planet and all its people. And she challenges him. All this death finally made you happy. Ecstatic. And has it calmed all the rage? I don't think anything will ever do that. And that's, that's what fascinates me. This master kills not because it's necessarily fun, it's like a drug for him. It gives him a temporary high that makes the pain go, the, the rage and anger go away briefly, but it always comes back. It's always there, driving his every action. Which is, I think, a, a superb take on the character. But anyway, the Doctor's main conflict at the end is she, she thinks she has to do it, but then the Master says, can you do this? Can you kill me all these other life forms and by in doing so become me which the doctor can't bring herself to do at this point this is, the character Kosharmis comes in and he's the one who actually does it while the doctor escapes i've seen a lot of criticism for this that the doctor you know just lets him get away with doing it and doesn't have any objections at all but I, I don't know, I didn't have too much of a problem with it, and I've seen people suggest that since there's a bit of, like, the Doctor in all of, like, the Cybermasters and everything, that she could appeal to that and make them actually turn against the Master. But you know what, I feel like if they had done that, those same people who are saying it would have been a better um, resolution would then be complaining that the power of love saves the day. Yeah, I, I feel like you, they would just, it would just give them something else to complain about. So ultimately, I don't think this was a worse resolution than, you know, what the alternative might have been. But uh, she sends the rest of the companions and the humans to present-day Earth and another TARDIS where they're going to stay for now because the Doctor has been captured by the Jadoon, which, you know what, I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. I didn't expect the Jadoon to come back, but... With, with their final line in Fugitive of the Jadoon, that, you know, they say the Jadoon contracts will always be fulfilled, I should have expected them to return. Uh, it's been a long time since the series ended on a cliffhanger, and this is definitely the most cliffhangery cliffhanger it's ever ended on. Uh, with the Doctor being captured and put in a prison uh, by the Jadoon. So... Now we're left to wait until the next special to find out how that's resolved. Uh, which, by the way, is finally confirmation it is Revolution of the Daleks. We saw Daleks filming, but uh, yeah. I guess that's pretty much all I have to say about the episodes. I really enjoyed this finale. Ascension of the Cybermen got off to a bit of a wobbly start, but it was still enjoyable. And... I loved The Timeless Children. I thought it was awesome. I had such a fun time with it, and no, I don't think the reveal broke canon at all. And even if it did, I don't care that it did. So, yeah, uh, I would say Ascension of the Cybermen, I would give a 7.5, and The Timeless Children, I would give a 9 out of 10. Uh, and then together as a story, probably be eh, about an 8.5. So, uh, I guess as far as finales go, um, I'd probably put this one around five or six of the new series. Yeah, the list is going to be up there. And then as far as series 12's episode ranking, uh, I'd probably put it at Haunting of Villa Diodati at the top, uh, followed by Spyfall Part 1, The Timeless Children, Spyfall Part 2, Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, Fugitive of the Jadoon, Ascension of the Cybermen, can you hear me, Praxius, and then finally Orphan 55. And then if you want to go by story, Spyfall as a whole is just underneath The Haunting of Villa Diodati, and then Ascension of the Cybermen and the Timeless Children 
is just below Spyfall and above Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror. The rest of it is pretty much the same. And the final average of Series 12 is going to be 7.7 .7 out of 10. So, actually, it's pretty high up there. I think, uh, well, in terms of episode, purely episode rankings, it's probably around third? Third or, yeah, third, I think. But, um, yeah, I guess that's my final thoughts and opinions on the end of Series 12. I really enjoyed this season. I enjoyed Series 11, but this was definitely a significant step up, and it's probably going to be even longer of a gap now before Series 13. They don't start filming until around September, and we are getting the special, but yeah, it's probably going to be about a year and a half until Series 13, which will be the longest gap between seasons in the new series. Unless you count between series 4 and 5 with the specials in between. So, it's going to be a long wait. I'm still perfectly on board with the Chibnall era so far. I'm looking forward to series 13. Unfortunately, after the special, um, Ryan and Graham are going to be leaving. So, they're not going to be companions in series 13. I understand it. Uh, we haven't really had very many companions do more than two seasons. But Graham was my favorite, and Yaz was my least favorite, and she's the only one of the three not confirmed to be leaving yet. So, I guess we'll see how that goes. But, um, yeah, a very successful finale in my opinion, a very successful season. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, please put your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. And that's a wrap on Series 12. Uh, so, we're going to move forward, over and out, and I'll see you guys later.